Greetings, I'm Eddie Muller, president of the Film Noir Foundation and one of the hosts of Turner Classic Movies. And I'm Jacqueline Stewart, Eddie's co-host and colleague at TCM and professor of cinema and media studies at the University of Chicago. We are excited to be presenting to you the recently restored film version of Richard Wright's Native Son, made in Argentina in 1950, a film that until now has been a significant missing piece of cinema history, especially African-American cinema. There is an amazing story behind the film's creation and its resurrection, but to understand it in its proper historical context, it's essential to know the background of its author. Richard Wright, one of the most important American writers, was born and raised in the Jim Crow South. Wright's family was part of the great migration of African Americans out of the South and moved to Chicago when he was a teenager. Wright pursued his interest in a writing career by joining the Federal Writers Project, where he researched details of black community life. These details infuse Wright's landmark best-selling 1940 novel, Native Son. The novel tells the story of Bigger Thomas, a 20-year-old black man trapped physically and psychologically within the confines of American racism. Bigger seems fated to be caught in a series of desperate and violent situations. Wright not only reflects on his own experiences in the same Southside Chicago streets, but also offers a trenchant sociological and political analysis of Black American struggle. We can see the influence of pulp fiction and crime stories across Wright's prose, and the novel has a strong cinematic immediacy. Wright wanted very much to write for film. He was constantly sending story ideas to Hollywood and constantly being rejected. I became connected with this film's revival when an Argentine cinephile, Edgardo Krebs, an anthropologist with the Smithsonian, arranged a screening of the film for me in Washington, D.C. Another Argentine colleague, Fernando Martin Peña, had deposited his personal copy of the film, the most complete print in existence, at the Library of Congress, hoping it could be restored. They persuaded me that in addition to a landmark story about the travails of African Americans in 20th century urban America, Native Son was a film noir. Its director, Pierre Chanel, had made the first film version of the classic noir novel The Postman Always Rings Twice, a 1939 French film called La Dernée Tournant. Given its graphic and unsentimental treatment of American racial politics, it couldn't possibly be made in the United States. Wright's novel had a long history of censorship and suppression, as we learned when the Library of America republished Native Son in the mid-1990s, restoring passages that the Book of the Month Club had removed. The Mercury Theater version of Native Son, presented by Orson Welles and John Hausman, almost followed a similar path. White Southern playwright Paul Green, who was adapting the novel for the stage, tried to tone down Wright's existential edge but John Hausman refused to dilute the content and worked on the play with Wright in secret. The Hausman Wright text became the basis for the film script. Pierre Chanel had shifted his filmmaking career to Argentina during World War II, and it was in Buenos Aires in 1946 where he saw a Spanish language version of the Native Son stage play. It excited him to make a film version, and when Wright moved to Argentina in 1949, the wheels started turning. Wright, who was considered a radical intellectual, was under surveillance by both Juan Perón's government and the American Embassy. He was given safe haven at Villa Ocampo, an artistic sanctuary outside Buenos Aires that hosted such renowned artists as André Malraux, Igor Stravinsky, Graham Greene, and Albert Camus. It was Uruguayan film producer Jaime Prades who got the project off the ground. He told Chanel he could make any project of his choice for the nation's biggest studio, Argentina Sono Film. Chanel told Wright Native Son was finally going to get made as a film and that Wright, who was more than 20 years older than the character Bigger Thomas, was going to play the lead role. When the writer begged off, noting that he had no acting experience, Chanel told him, all you have to do is live Bigger's nightmare. The film's assistant director, Gonzalo Sanchez de Lozada, started on the film just handling continuity, but his fluent English quickly got him promoted to AD to work with the English-speaking actors, particularly Richard Wright. 
he was really miscast. His personality wasn't as an actor, but he had no choice. It's hard to believe that because of the fear of being blackballed and not permitted to work in theater or he couldn't get the really quality black actors. The director took a small crew on a scouting trip to Chicago's South Side so they could recreate the neighborhoods when shooting in Buenos Aires. Chanel also shot location footage in Chicago without permits, which appears in the finished film. Here is Chicago's Black Belt, a prison without bars. Here behind an invisible color line live almost a half a million black people. The remarkable production design by art director Gory Munoz layers visual references to the South Side and South America. Since the film was about African-American experience, it was shot in English, with a number of actors imported from the States, including Gene Wallace, Nicholas Joy, Gloria Madison, and George Green. The film was a hit in Argentina, but when it came to overseas distribution, major problems ensued. Censors in the United States cut more than 38 minutes from the film, rendering it almost incoherent. Reviewers pounced on Wright's amateurish performance and denigrated the entire production, almost gleefully. Wright and Chanel expected such brutal treatment in the United States, but they were devastated when European markets, due to political and economic pressures, chose to show the mutilated American version, not their complete original cut. When Laboratorios Alex in Buenos Aires burned down in 1969, many of the negatives belonging to Argentina Sono film were lost, including Native Son. But in the early 1990s, Fernando Martin Peña learned of a film collector with a 16mm copy. He bought it sight unseen and quickly realized it was the complete version of Native Son. The Library of Congress located an almost complete 35mm negative in Puerto Rico. And it was this version that made its debut at the New York Film Festival in 2012 and was presented by the Film Noir Foundation at Noir City Film Festivals across the country. Now Kino Lorber has combined the Library of Congress's 35mm material with Pena's 16mm material to create what appears to be the definitive presentation of Native Son. Hopefully, viewers can now more fully appreciate this film's complex artistic aspirations and its prescient and powerful message.